How's it going, everyone? It's been a while. The second trailer for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet just dropped, and after watching it a couple times, I'm cautiously optimistic. Admittedly, I'm a bit more cautious than optimistic though, so I wanted to give my thoughts and impressions on everything we've seen so far. Before we dive into anything, I want to preface this video by acknowledging that yes, game footage is not final, and some aspects of what we've seen are subject to change. I'm just going to talk about what I see in its current state, and speculate about where changes MAY be made if I think it's reasonable to assume so. Between the trailer and the updated website, there's a lot to look at and talk about. The trailer opens with the player characters readying up in their room before heading out. Standard fare here, the room's got your TV, your Switch OLED, and some Pokemon merch. This room looks identical in layout and visual fidelity as it did in the initial reveal. The character's outfit, I'm assuming as a uniform, makes your character look like their lunch money gets taken from them on the regular. Seriously the lamest pro tags we've gotten so far. With the region being based on Spain, there's tons of potential for awesome architecture, and the vibrant colors of the player's home highlights this. We next get a shot of two different emblems. The scarlet one looks like some kind of citrusy fruit, maybe a grapefruit since those are scarlet, and the violet one looking to be grapes. The player's backpack and shirt sleeves also feature the logo, meaning this will vary based on the version you play. The game logos then fade in on a landscape shot of one of many different biomes the game will feature, and things are looking... okay. The draw distance is limited to what the Switch can handle, for sure, but the distant grass textures are a bit rough in that they don't exist. It's just flat green. The trees look better than anything we've gotten before, comparable to Legends Arceus, which I'm going to use as a benchmark going forward. There's some decent variety to the texture in the cliffside terrain, and the lighting looks good enough. Water at this distance looks simple. You can't make out ripples or waves, which I'll take any day over the awful sameness that we were stuck with in Legends Arceus. Immediately after this, we're introduced to the two professors, and can we talk about how gorgeous they are? Like seriously! The art team at Game Freak never misses when it comes to making interesting character designs. More importantly, for the first time, there are version-exclusive professors, and this is the first hint at what I'm thinking is the underlying theme of these games. The past versus the future. Professor Sada, the baddie on the left, is the professor in Pokemon Scarlet. Sada is the suffix of the Spanish word pasada, the feminine conjugation of the adjective pasado, which means past or old-fashioned. Her design reflects this in an almost caveman, ancient way. Her coat has furs, she wears fangs, or maybe sharpened stones, on a necklace, earrings, and belt. Her hair is wild and open, flowing back, with some interesting adornments. She even has fangs. You have to watch it really quickly, it's a blinker you'll miss it type of thing. The hunk on the right side is Professor Turo. On the complete opposite end of time, Turo is the suffix of the Spanish word futuro, or futuro, which, you guessed it, means future. His design also clearly conveys this, where his outfit is sleek and doesn't have many embellishments. He seems to be wearing some kind of spacesuit under his coat, and his perfectly cropped hair and beard are more akin to modern-day fashion sensibilities. We're reintroduced to our lovely starters next, this time showing off a bit more of their personality. Spregatito is basking in the sense of the flora, Quaxley is working on that glorious head of feathers, and Flicoco is appreciating the food in front of it like the adorable chunk that it is. The trailer follows the starters up with an introduction to Nimona, our friend and the trainer I expect will be our rival in this adventure. She asks an interesting question here, are you these three's trainer? It implies that we may be holding on to all three starters with how the trailer is framed, but I'm leaning on her just acknowledging that we've caught three Pokemon at this moment in time. She has a simpler design, the freckles and streaks of green on her hair popping on an otherwise basic looking trainer. Her entry on the website describes her as a powerful Pokemon trainer. Your friend Nimona has a sunny and energetic disposition, and she absolutely loves Pokemon battles. She's an experienced Pokemon trainer, and serves as a reliable guide for you on your adventures. She has undisputed skill in battle, though it does also seem that she's not the best at throwing Pokeballs. I'm guessing her lack of skill at throwing Pokeballs will be her version of the same shallow trait Leon had where he was so bad with directions. <laughs> I'm relatable because I always get lost, guys. The trailer shows us getting into our first battle with Nimona, and she introduces us to our Pikachu clone for the region. Meet Pommy! I think this little guy is absolutely adorable. Like the other rodents, Pommy is categorized as a mouse Pokemon. It's a pure electric type, and it's pretty tiny, only 0.3 meters and 2.5 kilograms. Its abilities are static and natural cure, so in addition to the electric sacs on its cheeks, Pommy has electricity discharging organs on its forepaws. It generates electricity by rubbing its cheeks, then it shocks its opponents by touching them with the pads on its forepaws. 
Not only is the fur that covers its body good insulation against the cold, but it also serves the purpose of storing electricity. When it feels uneasy, this cautious Pokemon will begin rubbing its cheeks, preparing itself to discharge an electric shock. The trailer drops the biggest new piece of information right after this. Our science-loving acquaintance lets us know that we can adventure together with three other players. This seems to be the natural progression of how the online communication worked in Sword and Shield, where you could see other players in the wild area, but not actually interact with them as if they could induce change in your instance of the world. We get a confirmation of following Pokemon here as well, but like Sword and Shield, it doesn't look great. Three of the player characters bolt off in different directions and the Pokemon partners lag behind, moving painfully slow, with the gap between Trainer and Mon increasing with every step. We're shown various shots of different environments and Pokemon old and new. One of the players sneaks up on a new creature, Smoliv. Love that name, it's a small olive. Naturally being categorized as the olive Pokemon, Smoliv is interestingly grass normal, like Deerling and Sawsbuck were back in Gen 5. It's also pretty small at 0.3 meters, hence the name, and it weighs 6.5 kilograms. It has the ability early bird, which means that it wakes up fairly quickly after falling asleep. It has oil so bitter and astringent it'll make you flinch. The oil that comes out of its head has a very strong bitter taste and is not suitable for consumption. When startled or attacked, Smoliv will shoot this oil out, slowing its opponent down. It will then seize that moment to run away. It's fine without eating or drinking. In the fruit on its head, Smoliv stores oil made from nutrients it gathers through photosynthesis. As a result, it can go for a week without eating or drinking. It prefers dry and sunny climates and it seems to spend its days sunbathing. The player makes what looks like a critical catch, nailing the throw and catching Smoliv after one shake. We're not shown the menu layout here, so we don't get confirmation if you can throw a Pokeball as you do in Legends, where you can navigate to the item via menus or press a designated button to throw on a quick menu. I'd personally prefer that they adopt the systems of Arceus because it increases the pace and seamlessness of the experience while maintaining the essence of the core gameplay loop, where we spend time exploring, battling, and catching them all. The next player is approached by another Numon, the absolute unit that is LeChonk. Going whole hog <laughs> on the meme that some creatures are just chonky, huh? LeChonk is the hog Pokemon and is the pure normal type of this region. That's pretty cool. 0.5 meters tall, 10.2 kilograms in weight, and its abilities are Aroma Veil and Gluttony. Both interesting. LeChonk is a gourmand with an excellent nose. LeChonk uses its sense of smell to find and eat only the most fragrant wild grasses and the richest berries. As a result of its dining habits, it has come to radiate an aroma resembling herbs that bug Pokemon dislike. Timid and faint-hearted, but also strong. If attacked by an opponent and startled, it will charge forward in a panic. It may appear fat at first glance, but in reality, this Pokemon's body is mostly muscle built by constantly walking around in search of food. With that info in mind, it's a bit of a misnomer to call it a chonk when it's actually packing hella muscle. This time we get to see a battle scene with the layout in view, and it all but deconfirms the Seamless Legends experience. We have the traditional tiles of battle, Pokemon, bag, and run, and there doesn't seem to be a quick access menu of your party and items. Even more depressingly than that, we have confirmation that battles are back to looking stiff and boring. LeChonk uses Tackle, and engages us with a small charge on the spot as Quaxley gets knocked back by the immense air pressure. Legends Arceus showed us that having the Pokemon move up to make actual contact adds to the experience and makes the battles feel more visceral and dynamic, even if its implementation there wasn't perfect. It's a big disappointment to me that we're back to this. It is possible that this can be changed, but I'm doubtful. The player is shown approaching a trainer next, with the exclamation popping up overhead. It cuts straight to battle, and the trainer seems to have sent his Choodle out from the same position he was in when we approached. It looks like we'll fade into a battle position at some distance from the trainer we engage, as opposed to a seamless transition into it. This is okay, as long as the battle backgrounds reflect the environment we're in at all times, and we don't teleport to some blank white space if we battle indoors like we did in Sword and Shield. We're shown the last two players interacting with each other near a terminal, which seems like it'll function as a Pokemon Center, Pokemart included. The terminal sticks out like a sore thumb against that snowy backdrop, and the colors are super saturated against a more muted palette. This might be to make them stand out during play, but it doesn't look great here. The two players conduct a trade, and we see the Pokeball fly out of the player's hand into the Sky Team Rocket style, which is a cool visual representation. A Bagon and Larvitar are traded, safe to assume that those are version exclusives. We're shown more environments, a field with Venonat's Vibin, a cave with some Colossal, a beach with some Toxapex, confirming that the meta in this game will be annoying. 
a snowy mountain with some cryogonal. An interesting thing that I picked up here is that none of the Pokemon so much as turn to face you as you run by. It's a bit weird that they all seem universally unbothered by your presence, and I'm hoping that this was just for the sake of the trailer. Legends Arceus again showcased how different Pokemon personalities inform how they would interact with us being in their space, and how much more alive that it made them feel. Whether they were friendly and approached us, skittish and would run away immediately, or aggressive and would seek to end our miserable lives. There are some quick shots of Pokemon attacks next. Gengar uses what I can only assume is Dark Pulse, as the visuals are similar to Arceus. Lorantis uses Petal Blizzard or Petal Dance, and Talonflame uses Flame Charge. It's a quick confirmation that a diverse selection of Pokemon are in this game, since it's safe to assume that this dex won't feature all of them. We're shown a battle arena, a pitch surrounded by flowers and a windmill, with some steps going down. I guess this arena is on top of a structure. No idea if this is for gym battles, or maybe this region is equivalent to the Battle Tower or Battle Tree. We're also quickly shown a pair of flags and a very interesting looking tower in a desert area. Without context, we can't say for sure, but the desert tower is the most interesting and may be plot relevant. We get one last shot of a player character running past a Pikachu and then both of them looking at the horizon with a massive cloud obstructing their view. I mean, unless they wanted to look at the smooth blues that make up their ocean. The gameplay then transitions into a very detailed and high quality cinematic that pans through a canyon to a mountain in the ocean and we're finally shown the box legendaries for these games. Meet Koraidon and Miraidon. As the trailer focuses on each legendary, the music changes slightly to match the legend. Koraidon's music has more folky percussion in it, and Miraidon's music features some synth sound effects before the sounds merge with both legendary Pokemon on screen. Turns out, they're both some kind of dragon or dinosaur that started to eat a tire and stopped halfway. Koraidon, the legend for Scarlet, is very ancient in design. It features large feathers and two long horn antenna thingies. The design is reminiscent of the stereotypical chieftain's feathered crown. The tire bulging out of its chest has some soft spikes on it, along with spikes along its back, and its color palette is super warm, with red, a rich purple, and hot pink. The name Koraidon is interesting. Instead of Spanish origins, it's very much Japanese. Korai is Japanese for ancient or time-honored, which goes hand-in-hand -hand with the theory of past versus future being at play in these games. Miraidon, the legend in Violet, is incredibly futuristic. It lacks spikes along its back or a big decorative horn, but instead features some kind of plasma shooting out the sides of its head behind its eyes, which are pixelated. The tire in its chest has some bright neon stripes, and its palette is cooler. More shades of purple, a light yellow, and neon blues. The most striking thing of all is that this bad boy has a jetpack for legs. It floats in place as the jet's carried in the air, where Koraidon stands firm on real legs, being completely organic. In contrast to Korai meaning ancient, Minai means future in Japanese, making these Pokemon the complete opposite of each other in almost every way. The absurdity of the design here has me leaning towards getting Pokemon Violet this November, not gonna lie. It's so out there that it circles back around to being really cool. Overall, there's a lot to be interested in. The designs of characters and Pokemon alike, the region itself, and the story that lay in wait are always fun to dive into. On the other hand, there's always something that leaves cause for concern, such as the seeming abandonment of the Legends Arceus seamlessness in gameplay. The graphics still not being up to what I think is a healthy standard in 2022 also sucks. To their credit, these games are definitely the most ambitious Game Freak has been in the visuals department, and I think if it works well, the group multiplayer experience will make these games a blast to play. We just need to know more about how exactly that works. Will we be able to engage in battles as a unit? Are we ambushing Pokemon together? Or is it just a slightly stepped up version of the wild area and sword and shield? Only time will tell. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. Have a good one.